Back in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s, the United States government had programs, some involving simple surveillance, some involving ways of getting information, some involving plots, basically to frame people for crimes, and some involving outright murder. It was secret at the time because it was by and large illegal. Really what COINTELPRO is, is you know, a militarization of uh, criminal justice. It was a code word that was used by the FBI, actual war against the entire left movement. To eliminate, intimidate, incarcerate, and terrorize a people. It was a covert war strategy, and it was done because the government thought there was a war going on. risk of seeming ridiculous, a true revolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love. El Mano Ernesto Che Guevara. There were um, similar sorts of things going on in Latin America um, around the same, same time. The Chilean government assassinated a uh, person in, in, two people in Washington, D.C., etc. Right. Was there... Um, was there any sort of relation that you're aware of between the national and the international things? Or? Well, I mean, not, not to be flippant, but of course there's a consistency to what sure. the government does. So, I mean, I think how they choose to further their goals um, is pretty consistent. We wanted to focus on the internal issues, which is what the COINTEL pro program did, because um, not enough is known about it, particularly with uh, younger people. Mm -hmm. When we take this into a high school, of course, nobody's heard of it. When we take it into some college classes, nobody's heard of it, or few people have. So um, I think, you know, one of the ki kinds of conversations we want to engender is to understand the roots of why things are the way they are and have they shifted, and of course the argument of the film is that they have. So, I mean that, you know, we could have a whole conversation about U.S. foreign policy and what happens post-Vietnam, but it's, a, it's really a different set of issues in some, in a sense, even though as you say, um, there's a connection. I think there is, and I'm sure you're implying it. So. Yes. Right. Um, the film mentioned a couple times uh, Cohen Tupper being focused on anti-war, anti-imperialist movements and uh, uh, white movements in particular, but didn't seem to have like, a, a section on that. Did you kind of touch on maybe some of what happened in those cases? Um, yes, and, and let me point out that, uh, you know, there's a lot of movements that were impacted that we couldn't cover just because of how, how do you approach telling this very complex story in a concise way. Uh, so one of the things um, on our website that we do is we create two sections. One is about additional resources. In, in, the, in the resources, there's a lot more about some movements that, as you say, just barely get touched. And I'll get, you know, I'll try to address what, what you were asking about, but I want to point to the fact that we're very self-conscious about what we couldn't do there. And the other thing that we've done is um, started to develop some curricula for teaching, um, which the intent of the film, of course, is to 
try to trigger some educational process and an organizational process. And so, you know, that's there as well. So I would encourage people to check it out. And, you know, the DVD has extras, a kind of more expanded conversation with a number of the most prominent people in the film that, um, you know, you can use and view at your leisure if you have it. Um, of course, uh, I think the government repression was very broadly based. I mean, we mentioned about you know, the anti-communism, the anti-anarchism of earlier forms of repression, the labor movement. Um, certainly the anti-war movement is referenced. Um, I think the, the reason for the emphasis on the movements that, that, we, that we do bring out in greater depth is the ferocity of the violence is far greater. Um, so no surprise, you know, if, if the strategies also governed by a very central issue of racism than the impact, you know, on groups like the Native Americans and the black movement, certainly, you know, with the level of assassination far exceeds the way that the SWP, for example, was under surveillance, mm -hmm. which it was. I mean, there's no question. Um, but um, the way in which lives were destroyed and the consistency of that to what we see today. So I often try to point out that, you know, in this period that's focused on the film, there were 300,000 people locked up in this country, and today there's two and a half million. And predominantly, um, you know, these are people with dark skin, right? I was just in Attica today um, visiting an old friend of mine who um, marked his 40th year. He was busted when he was 19 as a member of the Black Panther Party. And, you know, he'll have a, his 60th birthday next week. I mean, you really can't point to an equivalent among, you know, some of the anti-war movement folks. Um, having been a political prisoner myself, I know that had I been black or brown, I would have done a lot more time and, you know, the vehemence of state repression would have been a lot more intense. Not that I enjoyed it, but, you know, I mean, there is a difference in how it's come down historically. Um, not to deny that a lot of, you know, progressive movements get caught up in it. I don't know if that addresses what you were saying. I, yeah, it does, but I, well, the preface is that I was, I was hoping you could give maybe a little sense of what did happen to these other movements that aren't focused on. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the same types of infiltration, mm -hmm. um, the same types of disruption, the same types of psychological targeting of people to, and then in a greater sense, the, the intimidation and discouragement of building political organizations and movements, you know, very much what we are witnessing today with like grand jury repression that's targeting people who are in solidarity with um, the Palestinians or the Colombians um, and, and are active as anti-war people, the stuff that's based out of Chicago and Minneapolis. I mean, that's, that's a phenomenon that, you know, is consistent. Certainly infiltration, I mean, I, I was part of a number of different things that were infiltrated where active agents played a role and where people, in fact, got busted behind various setups and things that were going on. Um, when, one thing I guess now, um, I one time saw a, a film um, and, and it was about the um, attacks on the Muslim community as far as trying to frame them. And, um, you know, actually one of the incidents reminded me a lot of it because it was the incident of where, you know, there's, you had this person who goaded someone into planning something and then, mm -hmm. and then pretty much after goading them into it, giving them the plans, um, well, this film, you know, one of the leaders was a black Muslim leader of a Muslim 
a mosque and he said, we remember COINTELPRO. I mean, this is the kind of stuff they were doing then. It's sort of, are you, do you um, follow that stuff? I mean, I, I yeah, do personally, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, is, is that also? Um, well, I think the expression of Islamophobia yeah, yeah. and the way it comes down, and I mean, there are really countless cases over the, you know, in the post 9-11 mm -hmm. that have specifically created and entrapped people. And one of the reasons why that's so impactful is that uh, entrapment is, no, is really not a you know, defensible argument in the courts any longer. Um, and so, um, yeah, there are, there are actual prisons, communications management units set up by the U.S. government that are special prisons that are populated by them with Muslims. And the intent is to totally isolate, you know, Muslims within the federal prison systems, and they're run as control units. Control units being maximum prisons where you know people are isolated, where they're put into isolation. Twenty-three hours a day. Mm -hmm. right. I got one, two, three. Um, thanks for the film. Um, I was really touched by the incredible irony of the. Uh, the finding out of, of the information in media, via, uh -huh. in that how this, this parallels um, the cloak of uh, terrorism, which uh, with the Patriot Act it seems, and the current uh, the disinformation that goes on, say like at uh, G20 when uh, uh, people supposedly violent uh, outbreaks are happening and they all just happen to be, um, you know, undercover cops um, busting things up or uh, uh, that's not how it happens. <laughs> infiltrating uh, groups like this, you know, you, you find um, the, the use of disinformation in media along with um, the incredible things that this government will do to uh, uh, in, instill its will upon the people. You know, it's, it's incredible. And, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just glad to be uh, a witness to this and uh, you know, be allowed to uh, find out more information. You know, it's going to take indie media to mm -hmm. save a lot of what's going on these days. So, thanks for having us here, <coughs> Susan. Um, yeah, I was. Um, it was interesting because I I kept hearing mm -hmm. same words and phrases that I'm hearing again. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just always repetitive that the, the how they they seem not to become they keep recycling <laughs> um, phrases and they keep like recycling. Um, mm -hmm attitudes, but um, it might change as far as um, who they're targeting, but it, it, it seems like the same. But one of the things I wanted to, like, um, with COINTELPRO, because that had happened, um, was it easier for them, do you think, um, because nothing happened to the fact that there was no really repercussions to the people who did any of this, that they were able to, you know, continue to do stuff. Just like Bush, there was no repercussions for him in what happened with, you know, detaining people forever and all the war crimes he's done that now Obama thinks he can go and assassinate citizens without, you know, and it keeps going on and on because they keep pushing the envelope and nobody is held accountable. Um, do you think that that has contributed, or just the fact of the history being lost and that people get caught up in the fear-mongering and that allows it to happen? Well, I think it's all of the above, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, I, I think 
they do create a climate that's that's intimidating, and they act with impunity. I mean, the United States declares that it absolves itself of any responsibility for maintaining or abiding by international laws, humanitarian human rights laws. You know, it explicitly writes into agreements with other countries that our troops, if you can call them our troops, are not going to be held responsible for anything that happens when we invade another country. I mean, that's up front said. And, you know, so the, the, you know, the lack of accountability that you see with the cops, which certainly happens here in Rochester um, and everywhere else, I mean, it's unusual for somebody to even be prosecuted. The reason that in Oakland, California, the BART cop was prosecuted for murdering Oscar Grant, which everyone can see happened, is because people took to the streets and trashed downtown. You know, it forced them to restore order by, by giving some little slap on the wrist to this cop who, you know, basically got time served during his, by being held in a county jail during his trial. Had people not you know, had the black community not risen up, none of that would have happened. And it's unusual that somebody's even brought into this so-called judicial process. So I think that it's an interesting example in the sense of, you know, uh, our, we need to at least challenge or demystify that the legal system in which they set the rules and control the terms can be the same process that brings justice to the community. Um, and so, I mean, this is an argument to take the streets. That's not what I'm saying. But I feel like that the sense that we can appeal to their mor moral goodness to help us figure out how to, how to hold out of control policing accountable is ridiculous. It didn't work for Troy Davis to, to have a mass movement, you know, including the Pope, for goodness sake. You know, I mean, it didn't matter. They needed to send a message, and they did. I mean, it was a clear message of, well, irrelevant. All right, I got Mary, and then I forget her name. Okay. Uh, the film, some of the speakers make the point that Hoover and TAP officials viewed this as a war situation and were implementing war type tactics. So, and then the speakers in the film mostly were spokespeople, like leading, leading spokespeople for the different movements. And one of the leaders made a point how grassroots leaders were especially targeted, especially susceptible. So the question is, so you have the spokespeople, the people out there in the front, you have grassroots leaders who are um, highly politicized, working very, very hard, organizing in their communities. And then you have much larger groups of people who are sympathetic, who are with it, who are with the message, who are benefiting from the movements that are building. So how, how do you see this war on, I mean, we, we feel as war on communities, right? You know, we talk about war on people. How, how is that experienced by the people who are not the grassroots leaders, who are definitely not the, the leading national spokespeople? And, you know, how, I guess how important is, is it from a government's perspective to nip it in the bud before all of those people who are sympathetic become the grassroots leaders? Well, I think Kathleen Cleaver talks about uh, the attack being on potential, not just on, you know, the Black Panthers are a good example. I mean, this was a movement that was growing so quickly that the Panthers themselves couldn't necessarily create a, a level of, uh, of political discipline to the growth of their own organization, which, of course, opened them up to a lot of problems. Um, and a lot of stuff happened, you know, even internally in their organization that was, you know, kind of funky because it people were moving so quickly to mobilize themselves and to step up. Uh, and in, especially in the, in the extra section, she is very clear that the, the government, when 
when the government, when Hoover said that the Black Panther Party was the single greatest threat to the stability of the United States, I mean, that was actually an accurate assessment <laughs> of a historical moment. I mean, it, it wasn't just hyperbolic that he said that. They actually understood that if this wave of motion couldn't be stopped, they were going to lose a grip on this huge sector of the population that was no longer going to take the kind of bullshit that was being meted out and the level of racism and violence that the black community was, you know, experiencing. I mean, one of the reasons the Panthers grew is their willingness to confront the police because of the level of violence that was unrestrained, which, I mean, obviously they didn't do a good job or something, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they did, of course, but I'm being, you know, sarcastic because, I mean, the problem has grown to a point where, I mean, it's totally out of control. And um, so I think, I think that what you're pointing to is that, you know, things start to move and they understand potential and they, they know it's in their interest to destroy the, the potential that exists. I think that's why the levels of social control are even more maniacal now. I think it's a reason why the infusion of drugs in the community accelerated so deeply after the leadership of a lot of these movements was totally dismembered because people who are, you know, people who are looking for drugs to solve their problems aren't the aren't going to be able to arrive at a conscious, you know, political kind of motion, you know, so a tranquilized community isn't going to rise up. Um, it's not surprising that that accelerates, and it's not surprising that, along with other things, the war on drugs increases the level of imprisonment. So the social control issues are about dismembering entire parts of the population that are no longer serving a useful purpose to the system in, in the form of labor or anything else. I mean, there was a time when they were under slavery and today it's like who cares is really the underlying thing, I think. And so, no surprise, you know, and what are the options for a kid in the community? You know, you can join the military and have your mind, you know, turned into something that will justify going to Afghanistan and killing mm -hmm. civilians, or you can get into the you know, kinds of economy that exist outside of the formality of capitalism in the community and all the internal contradictions that that embodies, or you can live in a cage. And that's the predominant, that is the predominant set of choices. And None of those are very good, really. Okay. Where, um, two questions. Where did you find the song for the closing credits? And it's the second one is, do you know what Johnson's relationship was, with Hoover was like? Uh, the first question I can answer accurately. <laughs> <laughs> um, we showed this to a group of uh, spoken word artists in the Bay Area. Um, who were really taken with the film in an early stage. We were showing it to a lot of different people to, to simply to gauge whether it was communicating well. And one of the reasons we work collaboratively is the group of people, the, the core group that worked on the film are, you know, myself um, and a, a friend of mine who I've been working with since the 1970s doing media work, who's Chileno. Um, and a couple of African-American women who were in their 20s. And, you know, we brought different things to the process of figuring out how do you tell the story, and it went through a lot of iterations. And um, everybody really brought some kind of clarity and brilliance to it at, at various points. So one of the things we did is kind of shopped it around for its ability to communicate clearly, and these 
folks um, decided that, you know, they came to us and they said, look, you know, we'd like to, you know, we were saying, yeah, we want some kind of closing music, blah, blah, blah. And they said, look, we're going to write this piece for you and, you know, that's going to be our contribution to the film. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. They raised their fists like, uh, the Cohen, once upon a time uh, there was COINTELPRO and something raised their fists like, whoa, is what I heard. Yeah, something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Johnson's relationship to Hoover. I mean, I haven't studied on, on that level uh -huh. of detail. There may be somebody in here who knows. Uh -huh. I mean, there's plenty of things written about it. I mean, it was different than Nixon's, but maybe not much. You know, I think, you know, Iron Fist, Velvet Glove, all that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, who knows? Um, and, you know, at, at some point Hoover dies in the midst of all this, but the consistency of the agency, I mean, we know it's I um, I did a presentation at at um, a university in Southern Illinois. That's one one of their major programs. There is actually training people to become FBI agents. Oh, right. And the question that was raised from the audience about, well, but don't you think it makes sense to join the FBI and change it from the inside? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know, it's like I mean, I thought it was a I thought it was actually a very courageous question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes sense that somebody who's bought into, you know, wanting to be in this program would ask a question mm -hmm. like that. Because they're touched by the film, so they see that there's some contradictions and that there's some moral quandary here. Um, so in a sense, I really appreciate being able to be in that kind of environment with the film. Because, you know, look at what your agency has done. And they're saying, oh, maybe it doesn't have to be so bad, you know. Um, you know, well, it doesn't have to exist either. So, um, so that's always a helpful thing to throw out there. And just as, you know, a, a number of people who are active service were talking, and I've, you know, I've been very fortunate to meet people who have, you know, just gotten back from Iraq or Afghanistan, who, and in one case, this young guy in a community college in um, a Puget Sound area was telling me that his job was to work in the military's coin program, which is, you know, going great guns, as it were. His job was to protect State Department people who would go into the community and sit around and hang out with people and sip tea and essentially do a population map of a, of a small community. Then they would leave, and a week or two later, certain houses would blow up with everybody in it, of course. And that was their coin operation. I mean, it's not that different, only it's happening, you know, in Afghanistan. And, you know, he could totally relate to the film and was, like, freaking out. I mean, he was afterwards talking about PTSD issues that he has. And one of the things that he said that totally blew my mind is that in basic training, they're starting to put people on prophylactic psychotropics so that they're manageable before they're shipped out. And so, you know, I mean, apart from everything else, I mean, the kind of evilness of something like that, because the military learned what an unmanageable military in Vietnam was about. You know, I mean, they learned their lesson. You know, you can't have people in Geronimo, Gijaga, who um, actually died recently after, you know, all of his issues with PTSD from prison and Vietnam, tells the story of um, his unit after their first tour in Vietnam is ordered into Detroit in 1967 to put down the urban rebellion in Detroit. And um, they, after they opened their eyes there, and after their experience in Vietnam, essentially gave the community their weapons and ammunition and walked out. And of course they were punished by being sent back, back to Vietnam as cannon fodder. Um, and he tells the story because you know, to him, this was a significant turning point in his own consciousness of understanding, not about racism in the community. I mean, he grew up in the South, so he, but 
he something clicked for him about really answering the question that was that you were raised about what's the relationship between the internal and the external, you know. Mm -hmm. It clicked for him that, you know, okay, Vietnam, Detroit, what were they being asked to do? And um, it turned it turned a corner for him. It was like an aha moment. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I have L. Anybody else have questions? Uh, uh, sort of two questions. The first one is, um, I do video editing, and um, I guess you can say like I'm the director of the pieces I, I create. And so when you when you as a collaboration are putting a piece together, like how does that look like? Like technically, like how do you do that? Like do you all have like joint screens and like you know. Uh, Final Cut stations open or something, you're all like sort of editing together, or like do you just sort of edit, one person edits and then you watch it and another person edits, like, you could describe that process a little bit, and then could you tell us a little bit about like the Freedom Archives? Sure, thanks. Um, well, you know, there, there is, there can be a division of labor, there is a division of labor based on what skills are brought to the table. You know, so Andreas works as a hands-on chief editor for a production company that does reality TV shows. I mean, he does this because this is what he, this is what really gives him the creative juice. And when you're putting something together about crocodiles, you know, and people in the water and all that stuff, who cares, right? Um, so, you know, for like some finishing finessing, he's got the greatest skill, but it's what I mentioned before, it's, you know, what what is the storyline? We, for example, we started by trying to do it in a very linear way. You know, let's follow a timeline. And it got very confusing because so much stuff was going on that it was no longer telling a good story. And, you know, filmmaking is storytelling. <coughs> so the question that we kept mulling was, you know, how do we do it? And we ended up, for, uh, for several reasons, we thought the story was clearer, even though it doesn't follow a strict timeline. And it allowed us in the DVD to divide it up into chapters with intent so that somebody teaching Chicano studies can lift 10 minutes out mm -hmm. and show it in a class and doesn't have to show 56 <coughs> minutes when the class is like 45 minutes long or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work anyway. And so, um, you know, it served a lot of different purposes in how we kind of projected something like this being used in something other than this kind of context, the community context, where people do want to sit through a whole film. Um, whereas in a middle school or a high school, that's not going to be the same. Um, and, you know, that, that was the creative, that was really the creative decision making. It wasn't, you know, okay, I'll do it rough and he can polish it, or, or Anita, who, you know, is highly skilled, taught me, you know, I've, I've been an, an audio editor since I was 18, like I started doing it in 1968. Mm -hmm. Anita, who's like, you know, less than half my age, taught me electronic editing, you know, like digital editing when I got, I got out of prison. I knew conceptually what to do, but she really has the, you know, she has Pro Tools now. And that's what she makes a living doing. So, of course, she did the post-production audio. It made the most sense. It didn't mean that anybody else was cut out of the process. It's just, you know, it would be better that way. That was her bike strike. So, but we all participated in figuring it out. So the actual, you know, storytelling issue, which is the most difficult, we all did that. Um, so I don't know if that answers no, yeah, your question. Um, and the Freedom Archives, as I mentioned, there's, uh, you know, Andreas and I have been working together since the early 70s, starting off doing radio and some video work when Porta Packs came out. And um, there's other people who are part of that. Uh, there were in, in the Bay Area actual production collectives co coming out of various communities. He was part of um, a collective collective called um, Reflexiones, which was all Latino, and, you know, there was, you know, a group in the black community that was doing this work, and I was doing, you know, um, uh, gathering, 
kind of anti-imperialist news and doing a lot of um, coverage of like prison movement stuff at the time. And we all were ghettoized on a Pacifica station. And so because we were all there on Saturday, we all started collaborating and pooling material. And um, because there was no interest on their part to archive it because they felt like our material was, you know, not that important historically, we got to keep it. And so when I ended up in prison, I reconnected with people and we realized that, you know, the material that we had worked on some 30 plus years before was intact and we started talking about, you know, kind of envisioning how do we repurpose this and looking back on it, it gains in significance rather than diminishes in it. I mean, the film is an example. Um, and so we pulled this project together. You know, a bunch of people founded the archive and we ended up with a space and we unboxed things and organized it and then we immediately started working with, with students to help the cataloging process and started to develop, you know, numerous projects ourselves for repurposing. So, you know, we've got a leaflet on Leslie's table in the back with all the kind of releases of documentary stuff that we've done, including, you know, a project that was designed for people who do spoken word, you know, the new wave of culture to infuse it with content. It's called the Vinyl Project. That was the first project coming entirely out of our internship program. And we start with high school kids. Um, so we've always got a lot of young people who, who the reason we do that is to get people excited about history in a very different kind of way than, I mean, you know, Howard Zinn's good, that's as good as it gets if you're lucky enough to read that in school, but for most kids in high school or middle school, it's just, it's nonsense, we know this. So, you know, we've created the space and so we're working with certain high schools where people can get class credit to do work with us and it's been great and so the vinyl project was the first kind of thing that some high school and some college students and interns put together and you know when we manufactured it it just kind of totally blew their mind that we were willing to put a, a, initially a 12 inch vinyl out in the world with their work on it that all these DJs were picking up and using and they were just like man we are so into this so you know that that is a process and is also about how we look at our role in the community and then this is an example of us taking the media out and trying to you know put it in the community too um, because media is an organizing tool, and um, we've seen its effectiveness. The last film we did, which is called Legacy of Torture, the one just before this, um, you know, helped really mobilize a, a level of community pressure to fight the recriminalization of a Panther case, mm -hmm. uh, the San Francisco Eight. You may or may not have heard about it, but you know, it was certainly played a significant role. The week of the premiere is when the bus happened, so we, we held a big press conference and we had like national press and local press there and we gave them all copies of the video and sure enough, you know, the news reports were, well, the police say this, but the defendants claim that there was torture in New Orleans in 1973 and all this stuff was directed at the, at the Panthers. So they thought they were gonna totally dominate the messaging around the prosecution and instead from the very jump it was being challenged on some level and this is even the mainstream media so from the very beginning we were able to weigh in not only to counter message but to you know do a huge broad level of outreach and ultimately you know the city government majority of the people in the city government weighed in for dropping the charges, you know, the San Francisco Labor Council. I mean, it was like a big campaign. And for once, it worked. And so, uh, recently the last charges were dropped against the last defendant, Cisco Torres, uh, about a month ago. And we're having a big 
victory celebration in San Francisco as part of a cultural evening during the uh, 45th anniversary of the Black Panther Party, which is happening in the Bay Area. So it's kind of an interesting coming together and, um, and you know, so media can play a role, right? And we know this, I mean, we can see it, you know, all the stuff about WikiLeaks and, and all the indie stuff that happens, you know. I mean, we can prove that the cops do stuff. And so that's important. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't really kind of separate ourselves from that process. So that's what we do. And you can search on our website and look for material that, you know, a good part of what we have is cataloged. It might still be analog, but like the Kunstler sisters when they were doing Disturbing the Universe came through and they said, what do you have of Pops? And uh, so in, in 74 I produced a radio documentary because we obtained the actual court recordings of the Chicago 8 trial. So the sequence in Disturbing the Universe in which Bobby Seal is bound and gagged and everybody's freaking out in the courtroom comes out of a documentary that I did when I was 24 years old in 1974. As, as is his uh, Wounded Knee piece in there. You know, so you never know, right? Mm -hmm. The value that stuff can have if you create a resource and share it with people. It has its legs. So I've got L and Ryan and Leslie and Mary. Okay, well, we've got this uh, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy All Over movement that's getting big and blowing up all over the place. Do you see uh, any potential that this apparatus might be directed at that? And if it is, how do we know it's happening and what can we do to counter it? I, I don't know how to answer the latter part of it. I would assume that there's, you know, infiltration and all that stuff happening. Um, and I think it has a tremendous amount of potential, and of course they're freaked out about potential. We know this. So, um, and there's, you know, it's interesting to me to see a lot of new people in motion. I mean, it's clearly imaginative. I mean, aren't we all tired of going to the rally and hearing the same people? Mm -hmm. This is different, and it's creative, and so it has all of that kind of cool juice running also. At the same time, I think the Democratic Party would love to co-opt it as their answer to the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so here is what's happening. What is the responsibility of other people which you were asking, you know, like how do we, I mean, I think, for example, um, I was mentioning this to some folks earlier, um, a number of friends of mine in, in New York are going down there to do teach-ins on prison issues, and they're all former prisoners. Because it's, a, it's one of the weaknesses, you know, I mean, everyone complains and berates people, well, you don't have it together, I mean, that's bullshit, I mean, that's just, taking pot shots. You know, that's not the point. The point is, if you feel like there needs to be some education, go do it. I mean, that's what they're saying too. And they're open to it. So, you know, so you do a teaching, if you can do a teaching on prison, you can do a teaching on Afghanistan too. Or, I mean, you name it, fill in the blanks. That's how a movement gets built. And everybody isn't necessarily gonna buy into the most radical analysis or whatever, that's fine. Some number of those people are going to stick with this for a long time, and that's how our movement can grow and broaden. And so, overall, I think we have to take responsibility to make sure it's not co-opted. We can't guarantee that it's not infiltrated, but we can certainly look at it as an organizing opportunity the same way we would do it in our own community. Um, and because of the proliferation of it, we can do it in a lot of places. So uh, I'm supposed to do a community event in Albany on uh, Sunday night, and I was told, well, you know, the Occupy Albany people are having a meeting at the same time, so they can't come. So I said, well, why don't we go to them after our program and show the film to them, which is what we're going to do, right? I mean, they could stand to see Intel Pro 101, and we'll have a conversation about it. So, 
you know, that's a way to do it. I mean, likewise in Chicago, we did a, a showing with the American Friends Service Committee who actually opened their doors because uh, in Chicago the cops weren't letting people fall asleep on the street. So they were coming into AFSC, you know, to take a break. And so what's happening in there? They're showing, you know, a number of them came to a, the showing that we did. And they're showing it again at night because other people will be there. And I mean, to me, that's cool, you know. But uh, it's not just about our film. It's, this is about, you know, envisioning a way to intersect with people in motion and, and, not, and to get out of our comfort zones and be willing to go and respectfully engage in some, you know, some kind of process. And especially one that they can control themselves. That's even healthier. Uh, right? Come on, we need freedom, man. Uh, Healthcare for all, a security plan. Reparation for black and indigenous fam. Self determination for my sister and brethren. Divide freedom. freedom. Is it just avoiding the cuffs? Cause not being locked up just isn't enough. Divide freedom. Don't have to be locked in prison. To be a victim of this capitalist system. Come on, we want freedom. Self determination for our people. Freedom. Equity in order to be equal. Said freedom. Nelson Mandela back on the street.